Yeah, you heard that right. Justin Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, that was JT with a little F-bomb, but come on. He's the winner of the Honda Classic. Justin won the event, finishing at 8 under his second win this season, winning in a playoff over Luke List. Alex Noren finished one back of that. Uh, It was Justin's seventh win in his last 31 starts. That being said, Probably the best player on the PJ Tour in the last year. You could maybe throw DJ in there, but, I mean, a major FedEx Cup title. Two wins already this year. Hard to argue that. Uh, so let's go over that last uh, that last little comment uh, when he made that putt. After his round, he said, uh, please don't find me very much, PJ Tour. That's not something I wanted to get on TV. It was just an emotional win, and I was happy to get it done. Yeah, I'm fine with I'm fine with that. I don't really care if someone drops an F bomb on TV. It's not their fault the camera's on them. Uh, Tiger notably drops F bombs quite a bit. So for me to uh, take a problem with that would be pretty hypocritical. Um, that being said, there was a, another issue with Justin during the final round, and that involved a heckler. Uh, of course, despite all the good storylines coming out of Honda, there's one negative one that it's broken past just the lexicon of golf. It's gone into the actual sporting world. Um, and JT's taking a lot of flack over this from non-golf fans, golf fans, everyone, but there's obviously two sides, as there always are. Um, the incident occurred after JT hit a tee shot, which a fan evidently hoped would find a bunker, uh, and it escalated from there. Have a listen. On Monday, Justin took to Twitter to elaborate on the incident. Uh, I'll read you his tweets here. Getting a lot of comments on the fan incident yesterday. Sorry to any and all offended by it. There was more said as we walked to the tee wishing bad things on the course for myself or Luke. Then the getting the bunker comment over and over again. I felt it was very under- understandable to have him escorted out. I never want to lose fans or have people root against me. I just didn't see a place for that particular person to be yelling at us. Things that weren't necessary over and over again. I overreacted and should not have had him kicked out. I feel bad for it, but what more was more doing so because, again, I felt the stuff he was saying was completely unnecessary. I love all my fans and hear that I've lost quite a few because of that isn't fun at all. So I'm sorry to all. Two things here for me. One, this is just being completely overblown. A guy literally just yelled, get in a bunker. JT said, get out of here, buddy. Um, I mean, I'm hearing people say on one side, he's a punk, he's... The worst thinker golf, he's everything wrong with golf, this is awful, how dare he, blah, 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 blah. And then there's the other side, the people saying, I know, how could this guy yell something and Justin shot, you know, like, good for Justin for standing up for himself. Um, as usual, the answer, clearly somewhere in the middle. Uh, I think it's both possible, and hear me out, I think it's both possible for the fan and Justin Thomas to be in the wrong here. And really, it's just not a big deal. Um, who cares? According to Justin, this wasn't the first trip in the fan, which to some that wouldn't matter, saying if you're a pro, you should take it, but come on. Yes, Justin should have had his caddy or an official do his bidding for him, as he said, but come on. The amount of pressure and tension during a final round of a big PGA Tour event, especially on a high-strung guy like JT, it's actually pretty tame compared to how it could have gone down. We've seen a lot worse things Usually, though, like I said, between the caddy and the fan. So his caddy's probably not feeling too good about himself right now. But uh, making matters worse for Justin, it's the second time in the past few weeks he's done something like this. He's commented on the fans um, doing so. Louis Riviera saying, it was either Riviera. You know what? This is the third time because he mentioned something at Riviera uh, about Tigers fans. And he also mentioned something at the Waste Management about the fans there. And we saw him being a little whiny on the, the 17th hole that one day. So... I mean, it's it's fine that he wants to be like this. The only thing is the Ryder Cup's coming up, and the Ryder Cup's in Paris this year. If he doesn't figure out a better way to deal with these fans by then, uh, he's going to have an absolute gong show on his hands when he gets to France. 
I'm reading a book right now on the history of the Ryder Cup uh, by John Feinstein. I would really, really recommend it. It's actually really, really interesting. But a lot of good tidbits about the fan stuff in there. And compare, considering how the last Ryder Cup went uh, on American soil, the next one is going to be just... Those fans are going to get fired up. So, JT, you might want to uh, check yourself on this stuff going forward. Uh, speaking of crazy hecklers and fans, though... Have a listen to this story Big John Daly told to Pat McAfee about his experience with rowdy fans. Let's talk about how you handle some situations. You have a rowdy fan base, I assume, because I am in that fan base. <laughs> do you ever have any good yeah. interactions, or what have you seen some of your fans do at golf tournaments that you've been completely mind-blown about? Well, uh, Firestone one year, 94, I got heckled by uh, the Jeff Roth, you know, a, a guy that was a club pro that, you know, he's a really great club pro guy. He's played in the PJ Championship a few times. He got, he was playing in uh, Firestone. I'm playing with Davis Love and Neil Lancaster, and I can't remember what hole it was. It's kind of a blind drive, and I hit last, and Davis hit it down the middle. Neil hit it a little right, and I hit it right down the middle. And I see this guy holding his arms up. Well, the marshals told us to go. So the next hole is a drive of par four, and they're walking off the green, and I guess Jeff stepped on the back. I hit it just kind of in the left side, pin high. Next thing you know, I'm getting heckled by his parents. <laughs> the, whole, the whole way in. The whole way in. And I'm going like, what did I do? I, I, I went to rules of this, and I said, look, man, you know, this is probably on 16. I'd only played three or put up with it for three or four holes. I said, you need to control those parents or, or those people that are heckling me. I haven't done anything wrong. I don't know why they're doing it. I'll make a long story short, I, I'm walking, and from we played the North Course that year instead of the South or whatever because they were hosting some other tournament there that year. Uh, we didn't play the normal Firestone. So you got to walk a long way from the end of the club. I've got to walk right through a huge fan parking lot. This old man, his father jumps on my back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? I'm not going to, you know. Got a good couple punches in, but uh, <laughs> and, and this is an old man. Instead of Jeff doing it, he's thirty yards in the uh, by the clubhouse going, "I'll kick your body." Blah blah blah. Said, well, come on, man, you gotta let this guy do it for you. Come on. <laughs> and another fan from the clouds. Well, maybe not your typical fan. Uh, Kevin Na got chirped by a European cricket player for his slow play. Here we go. Morning, guys, and welcome to the Trump International. Kevin Nah, I took you out the other day because a tap-in took you a minute and 20 seconds. One minute, 20 seconds. This is what you do with a tap-in, mate. You start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven seconds. Get your ball off to the next tee box. That's how it's done, bro. Trump International. But other than that, it was a spot-on take. And uh, that John Daly story, classic Big John. Okay, Tiger, Tiger, Tiger. First things first, let's just say it was a great week for Tiger. There's not really much debating that. He started the week meeting a student from Stoneman Douglas on the driving range. Uh, his caddy, Joe LaCava, noticed that he was there. He brought him over to talk to Tiger. So that was really, really nice to see. Um, and he ended the week finishing in 12th place, which is by far his best finish in a while. Uh, the key... For me, I think this probably goes for everyone, the key to his comeback, it seems to be just as simple as hitting the fairway. Uh, I'm glad he was able to do that this week, putting his ego aside and laying back off the tee. Uh, I said going into the week, he sh I think he will make the cut, but he needs to start hitting fairways. So taking his ego out of it a little bit, um, going three woods, long irons, those were his go-to shots off the tee. Um, and if not for a poor performance on the bear trap, going plus eight on the week, he would have been right there in contention, and he finished eight shots out of the playoffs, so there you go. Uh, as it was, Tiger hit 67% of his greens in regulation, more than half the fairways, and he led the field. Listen to this. He led the field in both proximity to the hole, so his approach shots were, the, on average, closer to the hole than anyone else, and he led the field in driving distance on all holes. So proximity and driving distance. He's hitting greens. He's hitting fairways. It's just a matter of time. Uh, as I mentioned, he played the bear trap in eight over for the week. Uh, his tee shot finding the water on 15 in the second and fourth round, Friday and Sunday. Um, so as it turned out, take those eight shots back, he's in the playoff. Obviously, a lot of the other guys that were in contention had uh, bad holes too, but uh, if hips and butts, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Tiger said uh, after the round he was trying to get to six under, uh, trying to post that, thinking anything could happen. Turns out that wouldn't have been quite enough, but he did get to three under, uh, but then obviously had his stumbles, stumbles down the stretch. Uh, there was a good line from Justin Thomas in his post-round interview saying that uh, usually when he's in contention to win, he'll get a text from Tiger the night before, you know, saying good luck, whatever the case may be. But this week, with Tiger himself kind of on the edge of contention, crickets. Another interesting storyline of with Tiger on the final day. He was playing with Sam Burns. I think he was a 22-year-old, basically a rookie on tour. Uh, he said the only time he's played with Tiger was in a video game, which we've all done. Sam not only beat Tiger, he shot a bogey-free 68 and finished in eighth place, which earns him a spot at the Valspar Championship. And uh, <laughs> Tiger, I don't know if anyone follows, I hope everyone does, but... Um, on Twitter, GC Tiger Tracker, he literally tweets every single shot of Tigers, plus what he's doing while he's walking to the ball, et cetera, et cetera. So there was one moment, apparently, where Tiger, middle of a hole, he stops to uh, take a leak. He used the porta potty, and uh, he comes out of the porta potty to a standing ovation. So Tiger says, Yes, I am potty trained. Pretty funny moment. Uh, obviously, I'm not doing it justice, but uh, on the other side of things, here is Stephen A. Smith on how it's our fault, the fans, it's our fault that Tiger Woods is not the Tiger Woods of old. Tiger Woods has won 79 official PGA Tour events, 14 majors. He's 14 and won all time with the lead or a share of the lead heading into the final round of a major. At his height, he was the greatest golfer we've ever seen. His long game, his short game, and everything in between was just surreal. Again, I know this. And the fact that he was black in a sport that was never known for being too welcoming to folks with a darker hue only made Tiger Woods' accomplishments that more riveting, more mesmerizing. Bravo, brother. Hats off to you. Having said that, can we say this? That was a long time ago. So what's all the fuss about now? Tiger Woods just finished 12th in a Honda Classic event this weekend. In other words, he's nowhere close to what he once was and may never return to his old form. So what am I missing here? At some point, the fact that Tiger Woods hasn't won a major since capturing the U.S. Open in 2008, and that he hasn't won at all since capturing the WGC Bridgestone Invitational five years ago in 2013, cannot be the storyline. And if that's not going to be the storyline, why don't we stop playing games and just get down to saying why? It's because Tiger Woods needs his mojo back. It's because he can't get it. And guess what? We're all the reason why. What if we didn't care, y'all? What if we had wrapped our figurative shoulders around Tiger Woods and said, my man, we could give two cents about your personal life. Just keep handling your business on a golf course. Who knows what may have come of that? Instead, we placed our moral compass on his shoulders. The weight was so great, he looked as if he was drugged when he held that ridiculous press conference years ago telling the world, I am so sorry. Last check, he didn't cheat on us. None of us were his wife, his children, his family. Yet we moaned and moaned away. Now look at us. Desperate for Tiger to make golf interesting again to someone other than the avid golf fan. All because we wouldn't mind our damn business. That's what we get for messing up a great thing. Not surprising takes coming from Stephen A. Obviously a little ridiculous. His only good point in my mind is that we overreacted on Tiger's off-the-course things. Um, but other than that, typical Stephen A. I mean, you can't expect, Stephen A., you cannot expect the public, non-golf fans, everyone, in this day and age to not, to not be interested in the top athlete on the planet sleeping with a bunch of waitresses, doing pills, pee stuff, having wild weekends while having, on the other side, probably the most squeaky clean image of a perfect man, a perfect athlete out there. I'm the biggest Tiger fan there is, but, I mean, it's clearly understandable why people would have hitched onto this story. Um, in my opinion, we grilled him and kind of continue to for something that almost every professional athlete does, cheat on their significant other, but... Have we had the same level of trust and investment in those athletes as we had Tiger? 
I'm going to say no. And quite frankly, we know it, like NBA, NHL, we know this stuff's happening, but it's not, uh, it's not an independent contractor type of thing. So, you know, we can look at Tiger and judge him for things because he himself has this image. Whereas, you know, if guys on the Toronto Maple Leafs are doing it, it's uh, just a completely different issue. But obviously a little bit unfair that Tiger just got killed for something that, like I said, almost everyone's doing. But that being said, uh, Stephen A., you can't blame the people for getting on Tiger for this. He brought it upon himself. He did all this stuff. I love Tiger, but come on, Stephen. All right, the U.S. Open has announced some changes. Uh, they are changing the USGA, not just the U.S. Open, the Women's U.S. Open, all the USGA uh, events. The uh, U.S. Open specifically, though, there was an 18-hole playoff, um, which was the last major to have that format. It's now switched to a two-hole aggregate playoff. Uh, if you remember about, I think it was exactly 10 years ago, Tiger and Rocco Mediate at Torrey Pines. That was the final playoff of that type. That's one of the best days of golf in my memory. But uh, now we have the Masters, Sudden Death Playoff, the U.S. Open, two-hole aggregate, British Open, or Open Championship, wherever you live, four-hole aggregate, and the PGA is a three-hole aggregate. So we've got one, two, a three, and a four all mixed in there. Uh, the main reasons for this, there's some mixed reasons out there. I think really there's two main reasons. Light, the U.S. Open is obviously built for TV, and they usually have the final pairings going off pretty late. So in order to get a playoff in, if there's any delays or anything, they need to have a two-hole playoff. It really sucks for people to have to come back, like reporters, everything, having to come back the next day uh, instead of just moving on to the next event. And for TV, too. I mean, the amount of hoops and things that have to be moved around for an entire extra day of TV, it's, uh, it's pretty tough. So, yeah, I, I, I don't love the thing, the change, but it's kind of... You can understand why. Uh, the changes will take place immediately, so the U.S. Open at Shinnecock this year will have it in place. And with all the playoffs that have gone on this season, probably a good time for it. Uh, personally, as I said, I loved the 18-hole playoff. Just just the thought on Sunday, you're sitting there watching, you're thinking, how am I going to get out of work on Monday? Or how am I going to get out of school on Monday? So just the thought of that, that was worth it alone. But uh, Tiger versus Rocco, I mean, that was incredible. And it's, it's so cool to see... One versus one, mono a mono match play for 18 holes with a lot on the line is really like a throwback. It's ge- ge- legitimately a throwback. And uh, I love it, but I do get it. All right, this week on the PGA Tour, there are two tournaments, uh, but one of them is a World Golf Championship. Uh, so the other one is just sort of a meh crossover tournament. So I'm going to focus on the WGC, obviously. Uh, it is the World Golf Championship's Mexico Championship. It used to be a WGC at Trump's Doral. But for obvious reasons, that's no longer the case. Uh, Last year was the first iteration of this event, and it was handily won by Dustin Johnson. The course is called, bear with me, Club de Golf Chapultepec. It's a 7,330-yard par 71. Same course last year where DJ won with a winning score of minus 14 with Tommy Fleetwood and John John Rahm nipping at his heels. Uh, The field is currently, it's just 64 players, short field, but uh, there's no cut, and the field stacked. DJ, Justin Rose, I'm just going to read off some of your names here. DJ, Justin Rose, John Rahm, Daniel Berger, Patrick Cantlay, Paul Casey, Jason Duffner, Tony Finau, Tommy Fleetwood, Ricky Fowler, Sergio Garcia, Matt Kuchar, Phil Mickelson, Alex Noren, Thomas Peters, J- Patrick Reed, Jordan Spieth, Bubba Watson, and Justin Thomas. He comes in looking for back-to-back wins. That's just some, I mean, the field doesn't get much better than that. Uh, I mentioned the course. I will have my... Excuse me. I will have my picks for this week posted on uh, my blog, the Teeing Off blog, on Wednesday. Two weeks ago, really good picks. Last week, eh, it was a tough week for everyone. Um, I chose 11 guys. The top tier was Ricky Fowler, Justin Thomas, Sergio Garcia. We had a miscut, a first and a 33rd. Middle, I had Adam Scott, Scott Stallings, Russell Knox, and Chasson Hadley. 13th, 29th, and two miscuts. And all four of my long shots missed the cut. So overall, only four of my... 11 guys made the cut, but I did have the winner, and all four of those guys were in the top 30. Well, four, one, two, three, third, top 33, okay? Um, tough week, I'll admit it. Uh, I feel like it was a tough week for just about everyone doing handicapping. I saw a lot of people on Twitter uh, named Joseph on expense, but I'm happy I got the winner, and I'm hoping for more success this week. One thing I know, everyone will make the cut this week. Uh, obviously, it's a short field event, so no cut. Uh, it actually makes DFS harder in a way. 
because having if you have all your guys get to the weekend, pretty much in the money. But I'll have those picks tomorrow. In the meantime, if you're listening, please like, subscribe, etc. If you're watching, like and subscribe, or just let me know your thoughts. Uh, again, check out the team off vlog on Wednesday for everything you need to know going into the WGC Mexico Championship. And that's where I'm going to end things this week. Thank you for listening. I'm RJ McCullough, and I will talk to you next week.